All right, three, two, one, and go. We are live. Hi, folks. Welcome to our, used to be Saturday night. Now it's Friday night because Frick has to work tomorrow night. This is our, uh, our two-hour live. Answer any questions you have. Always have a theme. Every once in a while we do one that just is uh, ask Rob anything. I'll tell you no lies. Uh, we're also going to give away something tonight. Actually, we're going to auction something off tonight. You're going to be interested in that. A friend of mine, Mike Morris, came by the other day, and he said, Rob, I bought this from you years ago, and I've never used it. It's never been used. I'll share with that with you in a minute. We'll, and we're auctioning it, uh, auctioning, it, auctioning it off tonight for the Purple Heart Project. I got a bunch of saws laid out in front of me because we're just in the middle of doing a, a YouTube video on the saws and the story behind uh, my venture into manufacturing saws. I'll do some introductions and say hello to a bunch of people that are here in a moment. First, we have a question. Frick, any? Uh, yeah, lots. All right. <clears throat> Fire All away. Right. First one comes from Tim Beach in Cedar Park, Texas. Hi, Tim. He says, would MDF as a base for a bench hook dull a back saw quicker than a soft wood like pine? Well, I thought about that. I don't know. Um, I suppose if I had a choice, I would probably take the softer wood instead of the MDF. But I'm not so sure. I mean, if you think about it, if you, your bench hook is, you're essentially going to go into the same spot. So once you've made one or two cuts in there, you're no longer cutting through that hard exterior. You're into the soft inner core. So I, I don't think it would make much of a difference. I have both. That's why I say that. Can't really tell if it's ever done anything to... Uh, to encourage the dulling of the crosscut saw at all. So I think you're good either way. Nice thing about the MDF, of course, it's going to stay flat. It's, it's, it stays flat, but then it's not a big... Well, here, let me show you. In fact, I, even though I have wooden ones, I seem to use this one more. So that's one I made a long time ago. So you can see, actually, I just lied because there's quite a bit of it cut away. Well, actually, the, truth be known, I let students use this when we're teaching the class. So that has survived probably... Oh, 15 to 20 years. Next, Rick. Uh, next, it comes from BR Fenske in the chat. BR? Yeah, that's just his username. Okay. He says, how do, you estimate, how do you estimate how much lumber to buy when your project has many parts of different thicknesses? Well, so you have to, well, depends on how precise you want to be. If you're if you're working with hardwoods, you need to make you need to get about forty percent more than what you actually need. Need means taking every part and measuring it. So, if I wanted to know how many board feet were in this, can you get your calculator out right there? Yeah. So if I wonder how many board feet were in this, I would measure seven and a half. Seven and a half by three and a half, yep. Yeah. And if it's under one, then you go with one. Divided by 144. Can't be. Seven, seven, is it seven, oh, seven inches, sorry. Yeah. Actually, actually, you could go 7.3 times 3.5. Point seventeen. So, point one seven board feet. If I so if, if I wanted to make okay, how much wood do I need to actually start with? Then I would take that point seven point one point one seven and times it by uh, one point four, and that would give you a number that you would then purchase in order to safely get this. That's allowing for checks on the end, defects that you don't find. Uh, 40% waste. Softwood, 20%, but hardwood, 40% to be safe. So um, you can go through and take every piece that's going to be in that project and determine how many board feet. Now, if something is two inches thick or over one inch, unless it gets a little bit complicated, you can buy, I don't know where we're starting, but I'm going to assume you don't know anything about it at all. So when you buy hardwood, 
you buy it by the quarter. So four quarter is known as one inch. Four quarter rough is designed to yield at least three quarter finished. We can usually get seven eighths out of it. The wider it is, the wider the board is, the less chance you are going to get that because there'll be some cup. And then you can buy five quarter, which would be inch and a quarter. Then you can buy six quarter, which is inch and a half. You can buy eight quarter, which is two inch. You can buy 10 quarter, 12, just keep it on going. Of course, the most common sizes are going to be eight quarter and four quarter. And depending on how big your lumber supply is, you may only be able to get four quarter and eight quarter. So you have to determine how that piece that's going to be an inch and three eighths finished, well, that's got to have to come out of, if you're lucky, you can get it out of um, six quarter, but you may end up having to get it out of eight quarter. So whatever, you got to stick to that dimension. So you always got to round up. Figure out how many board feet are in it, add in all the pieces, and then do your multiplying one times 1.4 to figure out how much you're going to need. But when you go to buy hardwood lumber, you buy random length, random width. So it's not like you're going to go buy uh, a 10 foot by 10 inch piece. It's not how it's sold. Random width, random length. And the grade will determine how narrow those pieces are. The higher the grade, the wider the pieces are going to be. So it's a, it's a little bit of a complicated process. If you want to be real frugal, then you map out every piece. In other words, if I needed seven different pieces, I would see how I could fit them all on one board and then add your 1.4 to that. So I, uh, I just buy a whole bunch of lumber and just get what I want. But actually, you know what I really do? Jack was there to turn the camera around. So I used to throw away small pieces, but then I got smart. Thanks to our uh, mastermind group. Jake, are you around? Anyway, over there I have racks in the back. And I have enough racks that I was able to have a short rack for every species and a, another rack for longer pieces. So all of my pieces go over there. And if I need something that long, normally that would have been thrown in the scrap bin and burned. But now I just go over there and I can find something and I don't have to go get out another board and... Cut it up. So if you're, the, if you're fortunate enough to have the space and you can save and, and categorize, or at least not categorize, what am I thinking about? Yeah, if you, can, if you can organize all of your scraps by species, then you can save yourself a whole lot. You don't have to waste too much. Hope that helped. It was a long, convoluted answer. Rick? Uh, next one comes from the chat from Rigid Ron. Rigid Ron? Rigid Ron. Would, Ron? The, would the lateral adjustment lock on the Stanley Sweetheart low angle plane stop the play on the Norris mechanism? Okay, so it's, it's going to say that again. I've got, you're saying it to me and I've got to imagine what you're saying. So what, what plane are we talking about? Low Stan, angle? No, low angle uh, Stanley Sweetheart. He said Stanley with, Sweetheart. So that's their new version of the low angle plane. Yeah. With the lateral adjustment lock, lateral adjustment lock on the Stanley Sweetheart low angle plane, stop the play on the Norris mechanism. I didn't know they had a. I didn't know they had a lateral adjustment lock. Did he? Did he mean to say lever? Uh, well, he'll probably respond. Lateral adjustment lever. Uh, no, I don't. I mean you're. I don't, I don't, I'm not a fan of that style of plane. But your lateral, oh, and theirs is, theirs is, uh, oh, yeah. If I, I don't, I've only seen their version of a low angle jack a couple of times. But I think their, their advance and retract mechanism is built into the lateral adjustment lever. So as you, as you move that, that moves the whole blade assembly forward. And you can also use it as your lateral adjustment. So, if he's saying if you could, maybe if he's referring to if you could lock, somehow lock the lateral adjustment lever with that, some of the play. Either way, I, I don't know that plane well enough. I'm not a fan of it to be able to comment on that one intelligently. I'm sorry. Next, Rick. All right, next one comes from uh, Sherwood R. in the chat. Sherwood R. He says, skew block plane versus rabbit plane, which is more versatile and should be purchased first. Oh, skew block plane. So here's my rabbit plane. There's the rabbiting block plane right there. And there's my skew block plane. 
So one's tucked up in there, one's right here front and center. This one rarely gets used. In fact, I can't even, I'm looking to see there's some walnut in there. I don't remember the last time I used it. Whereas this one, now why the difference? First of all, uh, the only thing this does is it allows you to cut full width. So your blade is exposed on both sides. It's a not my favorite plane at all. This one, on the other hand, with a removable side plate and a fence, which is a big deal, allows you to do a very controlled cut with the capacity to go right into a vertical surface. I would, uh, I would put this in my top 10 list. This would be below my top 20 list. So there you go. Jake, can you do a flyby? Uh, well, the, the question was asked about uh, um, determining how much you, lumber you buy for a project. And I just want to show them our, my rack over there with all those different species. And in fact, if you can, are you gonna, you're going to just turn that around. Yeah. Let's go over and have a look then. Let's go. Why the beanie? It's cold. Keeps the hair out of my eyes. We got to get rid of this hair. I can hear them cheering. So, pine, shorts. I think that's 18 inches deep. Two. Oh, two feet. So, anything under two feet's there. Two, uh, what is that, four? Yeah. Four foot stuff pines there. So, uh, th <coughs> what do I use the most? I use a lot of pine. This is maple, and that's maple. Walnut, mm -mm. sorry, cherry, shorts, cherry longs. For some reason, I don't use a lot of, I don't have a lot of long walnut scraps left over. So that's walnut. So walnut, cherry, maple, and pine would be the, the woods that I use the most. And then I actually have some, uh, that's mahogany bits and pieces up in there. On that side, on this side is torrified. And up here is cedar, various types of cedars. Doesn't get used a whole lot, but at least I've got a place to put it, so I don't have to throw it away anymore. And then if you look over there, I I've think got, that's white oak up there, isn't it? Uh, right here is white oak. Yeah. Here is ash. There is poplar. There's Douglas fir. There's bird's eye maple. Show them the white containers. And then I got these white containers, and that this is full. This has got all of my, uh, all of my um, exotics. That's some holly. I, I actually, I've been trying to get that separated. Like, this is all pink ivory and, uh, and Brazilian tulip wood. Someday I'll go in there and organize all that. But that stuff you don't want to throw away because it's over way here? too expensive. Oh, over where? <coughs> the oh, and then, and then I have most of this stuff that's standing is all exotics. Well, or not necessarily exotics. Exotic call birds exotic. Expensive woods. But it's small enough that I don't have to go through, move a ton of stuff in order to get what I want. And then I got more stuff over here. This is the really expensive stuff here. But again, try to keep it relatively shallow so you're not having to move 50 pieces to get the one that you want. And then this one, this is my Ahmed corner. My buddy Ahmed down in California keeps me supplied with all these exotics. So these are all for making saw handles or chisel handles. Next, Frick. Uh, Alex Tapp uh, sent this in via the newsletter. He's from Brained, Minnesota. Alex? He, yeah. want, he wants to know how we set up our film equipment for YouTube and live streams. You want me to take this one? Well, I'm not so sure you know. Ken, here, Ken's got here. the mic right there. He's so excited. All right. He is. <laughs> so it's a frick show. Come on. You should so, tell him. You should tell him what Moose tells him. Take a seat. Take a seat. Yeah, take a seat. The talent's here. So this is our Somebody live broadcast it. station. It's an absolute mess because Jake throws all of his crap here. Um, we have three monitors set up. So this monitor here is our control center. It's where we uh, change the cameras, put stuff on the screen, pictures. This monitor here monitors the YouTube channel, the live feed, the chat, and then this monitor has all the questions that were sent in uh, via the mailing list. So, if Which you're monitor do you use to play your games while you're not paying attention? I use my phone for that. Oh. <coughs> uh, so 
be a part of the mailing list. Make sure you join that so you can submit your questions in advance. And obviously, I've been taking questions uh, in the chat as well. This is our uh, this is a Rode uh, soundboard, so it hooks up five or sorry four microphones, and we control the volume with those here. This is the volume of the one I'm talking on, so you can see it get louder and smaller. Uh, Jake built this little mechanism up here to put the wireless receivers. So we have a couple wireless receivers for the microphones. Uh, this microphone, just a wireless one there. So that's our computer. This is our old camera. This is a Canon uh, C300 Mark II. Very expensive camera, very expensive lens. Uh, it's meant more for cinematography, so we found that it doesn't quite pick up fast motion quickly. So actually now, what we're using for all our YouTubes and episodes and live episode, live broadcasts is an iPhone uh, 15 Pro. So that's what Jake's using now. Um, we just got all new equipment. We have a new tripod, everything. Jake has a new mechanism. You can't see it, of course. Yeah. Well, I'm, and I'm all done now. Um, but that's about it. So for the techies out there who wanted to see how it's done, really not a crazy setup, but uh, we find the iPhone's working really good. It's super clear, it's super portable, it's light, definitely compared to that. Jcat used to have to wear a, a backpack with a harness and, oh, there it is right there actually, on the ground. He used to have to wear this huge thing. But anyway, that's how we produce our shows. When we film a YouTube or an episode, the videos automatically get uploaded from the phone to my computer at home, and then I just produce them, and uh, Luther edits them, or I edit them. He tells me what to edit out, and then we go from there. Hello? <laughs> I'm done. He's still eating. So. <clears throat> anyway, that's what we do. I don't think there's anything else to, to know. All right, you're back on. I thought one more question came in for Frick. How do I effectively amputate my finger with a chisel? I've already demonstrated that. <laughs> Go back a year or two years. How long ago was that? It's two years, yep. Two years. December 2022. If you are a combat wounded vet that has been to our program, one of our scholarship vets, always like to know you're out there, puts a smile on my face and everybody in here. So give us a shout out so we can return the favor. So in the chat, you put at Ken. Remember, you got to do this. That's how he's going to find you. At Ken, and then your name, and hopefully what class you were in. So task my memory. Next, Frick. All right. This one comes from... Now, wait a minute. Did our audience drop at that last... No, it's actually up. It's exactly 420 right now. <laughs> well, hold on just one second. Let me do some introductions. First is Angie. So if you've ever bought a t-shirt from us, one of our Purple Heart t-shirts, Angie and her sister Lynn, they're the one in charge of that department. They do all the packaging, all the quality control and inspection. Do a wonderful job. Angie is Ken's cousin. She works here. Her, her, her uh, locker's out there. Everything is ready. We're just waiting for her to get here. But she's busy. She's got a lot of work to do. Ken's here. Ken manages our shop, keeps everything humming like a well-oiled machine. <laughs> Moose is here, plays left wing, normally right wing. Things are under construction. And also the purveyor of, everybody's got a dead cat on. You guys cold? We'll give away three dead cat sweaters tonight. Chris is here. Chris is our engineer that's responsible. What? Just do a list right now. What's Chris working on? So we're, we're getting ready. Oh, should have, Ken, would you be so kind? You know those handles that I did up, the wood handles? Yeah. Would you grab them? Where are they? They're, they're, they're in the shipping room, I think, on that. They're boxed up. Just bring one, if you would. Boxed up? Yeah. yeah, yeah, they're all boxed up. One? Huh? One, right? Yeah, bring one. Bring one, and we'll give it away. Or maybe we'll auction it off or something like that. Yeah. So, Chris, what, Jake, pay attention, sunshine. What, what's Chris working on with right now? Chris built our CNC machine that uh, is a four-axis, four-axis CNC machine that now does our handles, does our engraving. We used to have terrible engraving, and now that stuff is so crisp. Oh, I'm so impressed. I must mention that Ian makes our handles. 
such a well, good guy. Ian. Lately, Chris has been spending a lot of time engineering our um, paper, our toilet paper dispenser. It's an automatic dispenser that gives you the appropriate appropriate amount of toilet paper every time. <clears throat> Can you spare super, a square? Super busy. He's working on. What? It's gonna hit you if you get any closer to it. The square? Yeah. Yeah, we're we're looking at making our own squares. He's working on doing uh, wooden handles for our saws. He is. We just made a modification. To oh, he and too. he and Jake are working together on our. Can we show the casting? Let me see the casting. He's showing. He's uh, working with Jake on the castings. Uh, uh, we're going to make our own five and a half. We've been working on it a while. I'm going to show you the casting we just got. Jake and I have. Uh, Jake and I and Chris are going to see. We have. We're going to narrow down to three machinists, machine shops. Yeah. We're going to see uh, the third machine shop on Tuesday morning. Can you come in close on this? We're only going to do a five and a half. The plane I use 95 percent of the time. That goes up all the time, by the way. So this is called, focus down on the bottom and see if you can put two and two together. This is a super five and a half. And if you've been around very long, then you know who the guy is on the right. That's Super Dave. We lost Super Dave a year ago. In his memory, if anybody buys one of these planes, will know they got a little bit of Dave in there. And it's the, it'll, uh, of course, the brand name Cosman, May 2023 is when we officially got our first castings. Anyway, this is, this is stainless. Yeah. Cast stainless. There's going to be some really interesting features that you've never seen before. And that comes from using it and teaching it all the time. So it, it you know, you start to pay attention to the stuff that people are uh, struggling with and finding solutions. What else, Chris? This list isn't as big as I thought it was, but I know it should be bigger. Oh, thanks again. How did you manage to pick that one? All the what? All the parts. Yeah, all the parts. The frog, the uh, handle, the tote, uh, the front knob and tote, rear handle, rear, to rear tote, and the mechanism that's going to allow it to move forward and back. There's something else big that he's missing. <coughs> what? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Chris is responsible for our panel saws. We just keep them going. And where Jake's here behind the camera, and Frick's here, you already met. And Luther and his wife Erica are on a plane somewhere between here and Maui. Who else is on? Jack on tonight? No, I don't think he is actually. Yeah, <clears throat> not yet. Anyway. Anyway, so remember, if you're a combat wounded vet that's been to our program, we'd love to hear from you. At Ken in the chat. Okay, for next question, please. Uh, next one comes from David in Devon, UK. Hey, David. He says, a while ago, there was a lot of chatter about the relative strength of side grain and end grain joints. Has Rob come to any firm conclusions about this? Well, yeah. I mean, I was blown away, shocked. Couldn't believe it. Have I changed the way I do things? Hmm. Old habits die hard. So I can't see myself ever not somehow reinforcing a joint. If you think of a dado joint, uh, there's no long grain to long grain glue surface in there. It's long grain to end grain on all three surfaces. So I always put some kind of a reinforcement in there. Glue joint is great. The mechanical part of it doesn't allow it to move, holds it fast. But if you've got leverage on there, it's, you eventually snap that glue joint and it works free. So by having a mechanical fastener of some sort or just the way it's assembled to reduce that movement, then it can never break free. So have I changed? Um, I think if I was doing a small unit like that, a little single drawer, I might even, I might even just rely on... I can't say that. No, I'm just too old-fashioned. Shocked at the results, but still want to make sure that it has adequate, um, adequate mechanical. And I don't, when I say mechanical, I don't mean nails or screws. Not that, not that I'm not saying that. But whether it's a dovetail or, or a through wedge tenon or something to help, help hold it together. 
So tonight, we are going to auction off, we should start that right away. This is a Lee Nelson, number seven, but this is back when you had the option of getting the, uh, the Coca Bolo handles. Can't get that anymore. This has uh, my friend Mike. He told me he bought it because he felt like I, was, I needed his business. Mike, you're right. I probably did. But uh, that doesn't, I don't think it's ever run, been, been rode over a piece of wood. Jake checked the blade. The blade has never been sharpened. So it's, it is brand spanking new. And uh, the box is a little bit hammered, but for the most part, all the pieces are there. So here's what we're going to do. Mike donated it for our Purple Heart Project. Start your bidding. Highest bidder at the end of the night will get a... Uh, you can't even buy these anymore because, like I said, they no longer offer that handle. So just in the chat, how are they going to do that, Frick? Uh, they can bid just in the chat. I'll keep track of it. Bid in the chat, and like I said, the pro all the proceeds, 100% of the proceeds go for Pirate Project, which, by the way, the selection has the selection been, has been made. Uh, I just haven't notified them yet, but we will do that in the next couple of days. So the selection for soldiers, combat wounded soldiers, has been made for April class, May, June, July, and August. There will be two more classes that the deadline, I think, is August, and that will be for... No, that's not true. Two. When's the deadline, Jake? When's the cutoff for the September and October class? Uh, I think it's June. June. Okay. So, classes are sold out, which is wonderful. Next question, Frick, unless I think of something else I forgot to say. Uh, can you ready to do vets? There's quite a few. Pardon? Oh, Ken, you got some vets to say hello to? Yeah, a lot. All right. And, and the other thing we're going to auction off tonight, too... So this is, uh, this is the new, we're going to start offering a line of wood-handled saws. Uh, these are going to be done very much like these ones are done. They come up really nice. This just happens to be a really pretty piece of, of maple. You can see some figure on there. So this is resin impregnated maple, thanks to Sean Mahaffey, who does that for us, and uh, feels beautiful in the hand. So that is a dovetail saw. If you want it, start bidding on it. Highest bidder tonight, we'll get it. Ken, who's here? Where, are you starting it? Don't start the dovetail saw auction already. Why? It'll get confusing. Well, why they say say one says plane, one says saw. We're at, we're at twelve fifty one right now for the plane. Twelve dollars and fifty one cents or twelve hundred and fifty one. Twelve hundred and fifty one. That's awesome. Thank it, you. It These escalated. Are awesome. It escalated really quickly. Uh, okay, you need a question. I need a question. John. Well, wait, wait. No, you didn't satisfy. Can, we, can they not bid on the saw? Uh, yeah. Just, can, just How close can they see? Can they see that? Jake, what are you laughing at? Comments. From who? <laughs> <laughs> if you're bidding on the saw, just put saw just dash. Just put saw. Saw dash and yeah. then the price. Right now, the, the plane is at 1251 Robert Harms is the... Uh, Winning bidder so Robert, far. Come on, Robert. All right. And your ground. Uh, Ken's going to tell us. Ken's going to tell oh, yeah. us. Go Who ahead, we got, Ken. Ken? Jake, help me, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, John Beck's on. Clarksville, John Beck, Tennessee. Vietnam. Hi, John. Uh, let's see. Jeff O'Connor's on. Jeff O'Connor. Uh, Jeffrey. Made that. Jeff is a, a very good friend of mine. I, he and... Uh, he and I and Kim and Kevin have been uh, meeting together two or three times a week for, I don't know how many years we've been doing it. Oh, wow. But Jeff, uh, and Jeff, got to say a little something about Jeff. So Jeff takes this to heart. Oh, I got a little bit of a lecture too tonight. Jeff, um, for the month of December, all the proceeds from all of his apparel sales, so O'Connor Woodworking, he donated the entire not 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 the uh, sales minus the cost, the total sales, which was over was a thousand dollars to the Purple Heart Project. That's huge. Thank you, Jeff. He's also done a remarkable job at at uh, blue chipping. So I got to explain this. Be well, I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna say hi to these guys first. Then I'm gonna explain that. Okay. Next month. 
All right, so John Beck, Jeff O'Connor, uh, Sid's on, Sid? also known as John Borden. <laughs> yes. Howdy, Sid. Your your boss is here. Sid works here. Sid, uh, Sid, uh, thirty two years combat engineer, Canadian Army. Sid works here with us one day, one day a week, and he works up in Fredericton one day a week with Chris. Sibby from Iceland is on. Sibby. He was asking about advanced classes, if there's any more information on that. Yeah. Um, so if you look right over here, Jake, if you look right over here, I'm completely redoing this and installing the drawer slips so that we'll have appropriate fo photographs of what's going to occur. But uh, I asked Luther to have that ready for purchase by the end of, October, end of January. Be, there are going to be three classes, and the three classes are, we know the dates. Yes. Can, we, can we post the dates? May 20, I know them. Do you have them? May 27th to June 1st. May 27th to June 1st. July 29th to August 2nd. July 29th to August 2nd. October 7th to 12th. And October 7th to 12th. Three classes, all going to be the same. Drawer making. You are going to learn to get that beautiful piston fit drawer. Making the case. It's going to be a fun class. I can't wait. Can't wait mostly because I get to see you guys again because everybody that comes to the class has to have already been here. So it's old home week in Grand Bay. Okay. John Brown, more mock toe, JB. Hey, John. Yeah. Didn't uh, John just get his bench just recently? Uh, oh, no. John got no. John, the the uh, the boys up in Moncton built John's bench. He was delivered here. Yeah, he got it. For some reason, I was thinking I just read something about John. Uh, let's see. Patrick Glenn, he was in class. Yeah, I remember Patrick. Uh, Matt Olson, May 23rd, May 2023. Hey, Matt. Uh, Douglas Berger, August 22. Mm -hmm. Douglas. Mike Delvoy. Mike, Mike's down in, Mike's down in Florida. Do I say that every no. time? And he's not. Duke. And Mike's in Michigan? No, Wisconsin. Wisconsin? That's yeah, all that area. It's cold. Hi, Mike. Brent, Brent Nelson is on. Brent Nelson. Let me see. Why do I know that name? Oh, yes. The slowest dovetail in the world. Also one of the best. Oh, I got to tell you. So, so Brent and, uh, shoot, I can't stand when I remember. Brent was recently on television on Fox News out in Colorado with, remember the chap's name? Remember the chap's name, Jake? He's a bench. He's one of our bench brigade members. I got I to gotta work on my memory. Anyway, so they were on there. They were interviewed all about the Purple Heart Project and the Bench Brigade. And Brent was on there bragging about how fast he cut duct. <laughs> Tried to do that with a straight face. Who else? Uh, uh, Jim Pearson's on. He, was, he wasn't a scholarship vet, but he's a vet, and he attended October 23. Hey, Jim. Uh, Jerry Pickering from May 22. Jerry, Vietnam Kevin, uh, medic. Kevin Burris is on. Kev, baby. Kev makes these. He does our laser engraving. I think I got, he owe me one. Kev, remember, you owe me one. We've got our uh, mission statement out there somewhere. This one is the... Uh, how many rules for success? 11? Kevin does all kinds of stuff. If you have anything that's, that you really want carved in stone, get a hold of Kevin. Burris, B-U-R-E-S, woodworking.com. Uh, Jim Eakin is on. June Jim? 22. Golden Eye. Mark Rains of uh, he, uh, number 26 class. Number 26, that was our last one. Was it? Okay, well, you yeah. won it. <laughs> According to him. <laughs> remember Mark, Jake? Sorry, Mark who? Rains, R A Y N E S. Just a minute. Look, look him up so I can see his picture because then I'll remember. I, I wish we had that right here in front of me so I could put. Anyone else? Uh, Kevin Smiro. Hey, Kev. That's Kev's flag right there. It's one that I put in the case. Great guy. And Kev's also helping out with the Purple Heart Project. He and Devin Archer. Devin, uh, what's Devin's last name? Jake, what's Devin's last name? Devin. We know who he is. Devin Wright. What? Devin Wright. Devin Wright, yes. And his wife, Ellie. What, what, anyone else, Ken? Uh, just looking, no, I think 
think that's it for now. All right. Oh, Ferris. 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 Butler. Ferris Butler. Ferris Bueller. Um, Good guy, Ferris. Does a lot of work. Does a lot of work helping wounded vets, and he's an amputee. And he's a single amputee himself. He was being disrespectful, so I deleted one of his comments. Who? Sean Grumbles is on. Sean was being disrespectful. Yes, toward me. <laughs> Sean's good guy. We'll have uh, that it. Questions, Rick? We've got to keep things moving. I can hear Luther in my earpiece, even though he's not here. All right, this one comes from Chase Him Down in the chat. Chase Him Down? That's his username, yeah. Hey, keep, keep verb vocalizing the, uh, the, aux uh, the uh, price on the plane. What, what kind of saw is it? Is it a dovetail? Yeah, it's a dovetail. Okay, so currently it's at 210. And the plane is at twelve ninety nine. So, so chase him down. Says, "Hi, Rob. I'm a seventeen year old woodworker with a number seven, a number five, and a number three Stanley hand planes and two Stanley block planes. Do you think I need a different size of plane or another type?" So you have a number seven, a number five, and a number three, and they're Stanleys and, and two, a couple of block planes. Two, Pardon? Yeah, two Stanley block planes. Two block planes. So. Yeah, if you're serious about it, meaning you're going to do a lot more. So I'm going to count up how many planes I have here at my disposal. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We won't count that. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Call that one, 16 planes. So I have 16 planes within reach. And 90... Give me an educated guess. 95% of the time? Probably 91 half. 91 and a half percent of the time, I use the five and a half. So, begs the question, why do I need the others? Occasionally, you're going to want a long jointer. Occasionally, you're going to want a block plane and a shoulder plane. There's a few essentials. But if this is the workhorse, is this, if this is the one that does all the work, if you're anywhere near my size, meaning you're 150 pounds or better, then you want a five and a half. Why? Well, it's, and, and you don't, uh, this, is the, this is, we weighed them one time. Do you remember, Jake? If we compared the weight of a five and a half Stanley to a five and a half Wood River. How much of a difference was it? It was a two pound difference, but it wasn't exactly fair because it was a bedrock five and a half, which was Two and a quarter, not two and three eighths. So it wasn't. It was a little less material. Yeah. There is a substantial difference. You want weight. It's weight is your friend in your plane. This is nice and solid. Now this is a Wood River. You could. I'd say the same thing about a uh, a uh, a Lee Nelson. I would spend the money and buy one of these. You're going to find better tolerances, meaning sole is going to be flatter, sides are going to be more square. It's it, the fact that it's so nice and heavy. When you plane, there's a difference in the sound. If I dug out a Stanley and planed it, you'd hear, a, you'd hear what you could interpret as a high-pitched vibration. You don't get that with this. This is dead. It just peels stuff off beautifully, and it leaves a wonderful finish. So I would take all the planes that you have. I probably wouldn't do much anything with them, and I would invest in a five and a half, and you'll thank me for that. Fantastic on the shooting board because that extra heft. Just, just a great plane. If I, have, if I found one that was better, I'd use it. That's the one I use. Don't throw away your seven and a half, or your number seven. And the block plane, I've got to address that too. Um, again, it's the, it's the weight, it's the mass, it's the level of precision. Show you one thing. If you take your Stanley apart and you look at the bedding surface, so that's the part that your blade rests on. On a lot of those old Stanleys, they had a little wee short, they all did, but they had a little wee short milled area right up here near the throat. And the blade sat on that, and then it rested back here somewhere. And the lever cap would apply pressure behind that seating area. So if you're putting pressure, especially on a thin blade, if you're applying pressure behind the seating area, thin blade, you're literally popping the front edge of the blade up off of the seating area. No wonder those things didn't perform well. So I would spend, I really like this. I used to like the Lee Nelson better. 
I, and when I first got this, it was wider and it's not quite as comfortable, but I've really gotten to like this. I like the extra width, fits well in the hand, and I really love that. One of the pains with the other one I mentioned was having to loosen the spin wheel to make your adjustment, and then you got to tighten it up again. This, you just pop the cap, and that takes off just enough pressure so you can go in there and make your adjustments and snap that back into place. Adjustable toe plate so you can open and close your throat to control tear out. So I would probably replace those two planes. You might be able to do something with your Stanley number no. 7. They were notoriously out of flat, so... And that's a, that's a big task to try to flatten something that large. But get yourself a five and a half. If you're, out, if you're outside the United States, you can get it from us. <coughs> if you're inside the United States, buy it through Woodcraft. Next, Rick. Uh, this one comes from the uh, email list. Uh, John Welkerwitz in Asheville, North Carolina. John Welkerwitz. In w Asheville, Walker, North Carolina. Walker Wits, I think. Asheville, North Carolina. Yeah. He says, How long do you Hi, John. Let, how long do you let wood acclimate in your shop before processing it? And do you let it reacclimate after it has been processed? Well, if you really wanna if you really wanna be as accurate as possible with this, then you take your piece of wood, bring your bring what you're building into the shop, weigh it. Get a scale. What do, we, what do you pay for a scale accurate enough to do this, Jake? <coughs> Digital scale. $50? Oh, not even. Not even? Well, if you, I mean, if you're talking about a relatively large piece of wood, I mean... A, bo a, a board. A gram. A board. They measure our $13 at the hardware store. <coughs> digital, digital scale. Weigh your board. A couple days later, weigh it again. And record it. And just keep watching because it'll eventually stop gaining or losing. Remember, if you're bringing a dry board into a more damp environment, it's going to gain weight. It's going to pull some of that moisture from the air into the board. If you're bringing a damp board into a dry environment, it's going to give off some of that moisture. And it's going to lose weight. At some point, the weight is going to drop a little, gain a little, drop a little, gain a little. When it does that, it's now reached equilibrium. And that's as stable as it's going to get. And if you want, the best bet is always to open it up. So if you want to be really, really precise, cut, rough cut your lumber, dimension it, but leave it heavy enough that you can go back in and redimension it. And then once you've dimensioned it the first time, where you've opened it up, then start doing the thing with the scale to check the weight. And when it finally equalizes, then you can pretty much say, okay, that's not going to move anymore. Then you can go ahead and finish dimensioning it, and away you go. And that's, that's as close to being scientific as you're going to get when it comes to controlling wood movement. Good question. Next, Rick. Uh, next one comes from Amy in Alaska. Amy in Alaska? She says, Hi, Amy. I, I need to know how to support heavy objects on French cleats correctly. Could you explain? How to support heavy objects on French cleats. Well, here's a good example. Uh, we were, Jake, you're going to need to move the camera. So we, I've got two examples here, one over there, one over here, and neither one of them have the actual box. So we were trying to come up with a uh, box for our fancy chisels. So... This was the box I made, and is this one over there or over there? No, over there. Over there? You so, there's your French cleat. There's the, the uh, female portion. So, this piece of the board has an angle on there. I don't know how many degrees it is. Let me see if I can give you a uh, close guess. I would say that that's probably... Uh, 20 degrees. So here's the other piece, and it's well secured. By the way, there's a little magnet in behind there. Well secured on there. So when that sets on there, it holds it. The problem is that if you were to lift and bump that at all, it, it'll fall off. So what I would do is I would somehow put one screw somewhere in there 
to hold that just to keep that from moving. Now, if that was really heavy, I wouldn't worry about it. But um, any, uh, anything large, and of course, you want, your, you want, your, you want the uh, male portion fastened well to the wall. I, I certainly wouldn't do this just with wall anchors. I would, look for, I would want to make sure that I was in at least one stud, preferably two. So if that's good and secure. And you could increase the angle too. You increase the angle, it's going, I did this one too. This one almost looks like 45 degrees. Do you know where that one is? Mm. Should be right around it's here a somewhere. Huh? It's a partial, it was never finished. Well, the, yeah, but the box, the box was done. No. Yeah, it was. It's been hanging on the wall. Yeah, as just a box. Yeah. Like I, it, that's what I mean, like it didn't, it was never filled. Here it is right here. So if you can look up in there, you can see that this one's got a lot more, a, a much uh, steeper angle on it. And I don't want any, I don't want any side to side slop either. So that fits down in there really well. Now that, you know, even with that door banging, I wouldn't be worried about that. But again, yeah, I suppose you could break that. I think you should get, I, I would like to have one screw at least just pre preventing that at from least? moving. One screw at least, depending on depending, it, uh, depending on the size. Yeah. One screw just to keep it from moving around, but that's going to support all the weight for you. You're not going to have a problem that way. It's a nice, it's a nice clean way of attaching something to a wall, and you don't have to see hideous screws or nails. Good question. Next, Carlos Morales from Mexico. Carlos from Mexico. What's the advantage of resin composite material for handsaw handles over solid wood? Oh, so what they do, and uh, I've never done it. There's lots of people on there that have. What they do is they dry the piece out. They put it in a vacuum chamber with a resin. And as the vacuum is pulled, the air comes out, bubbles out, and it has to be replaced with something. So when the air comes out, the resin goes in and fills it, and it stabilizes it. What I like about it is it almost plasticizes the wood. So that handle, have you ever felt this handle polished up, Chris? Okay, so we're gonna get it. We're gonna get a. We're gonna get a live reaction. Is he coming up or? No, you going? you're gonna go over there. So I'm just putting this on here so that I don't get fingerprints <laughs> on it. So this handle has been sanded and buffed. There is no finish. Doesn't take a finish well. So I'm going to feel that and tell me how it feels. Catch him, catch him, Moose. <laughs> Incredibly smooth. Isn't it? Yeah, it's amazing. It is amazing. It's like glass. Yeah. Ken knows. I felt it many times. Yeah. <laughs> it's gorgeous. People, the first thing you hand to them, they go, oh, wow. So if you want, and I, I want it for the extra weight, I think, uh, what did Sean say, 30%? But I think you can almost get a 30% increase in the weight, but um, stabilizes it. I, I don't know this for a fact, but I would, I would assume that because of that, it probably is not going to be absorbing and releasing moisture like regular wood. wood, wood. It sinks, more. It sinks, yeah. Oh, yeah, specific gravity would be above one once you've done that. So I, uh, I like it for the stability, I like it for the increased weight, and I love it for the finish that it allows. So hopefully that's enough to convince you. Next, Rick. Uh, Ron Bingham in Sleaford, Lincolnshire, UK. Hi, Ron. That name sounds very familiar. <clears throat> he says, could you please explain the bird's eye in maple? Well, where is it? Yeah, right there? Oh, no, you can see. So, the, first of all, the bird's eyes radiate out from the center. So, my understanding is that it's a dormant limb. Started and didn't, didn't grow, didn't finish. Um, I've never heard any explanation as to why that I believe. Oh, everybody's kind of got a guess. If anybody actually knew, they'd be making it. So, there's what it looks like. This is a really nice piece of bird's eye. And these eyes are pretty big. You see that? These are some really big eyes. So these ones are big eyes too, but yeah, that's not machined. You can't see it. So here's a, here it is in log form. 
So there's a half of a bird's eye log. And if you look really close, do you see these? These pecs? These are all bird's eyes. And they'll, they'll telegraph right through into the bark. You can see them all down there. So the eyes come out like this, out from the center. They radiate out from the center. So if the more perpendicular you are to the way, that line that they come out from the center, the more you're going to actually see an eye. And if you start getting cutting alongside of it, you're going to just see a, a long, like a long spike, a long ray. Not nearly as nice. Yeah, some more over here. Here's a piece of torrified bird's eye. So that's maple that's been cooked. Gives it that lovely patina. There's some, uh, this is all bird's eye. So you can see, look in here. You can see various size eyes. Some stuff, the stuff is really big. Look at this piece up here. Those are really big eyes on that big plank as opposed to the, how small these ones are. But the best definition I have is it's a deep, it's uh, something has happened to, to uh, alter the growth of a limb, and it, a dormant bud is the best explanation I can give you. It's not quite as rare as people are led to believe. We have quite a bit of it around here, and like I said, you can, when, once you know what you're looking for, you can see it in the bark, so you don't have to go and cut a slab off the side of a tree to find it. Next, Rick. Uh, this next one comes from the chat uh, from username What's on the Bench. What's on the Bench? Uh, he says, for the wood hinge dowel, how do you get a radius on the end that matches the bit? How? Do, oh, so if you want to, what he's talking about, I assume, is, i got to move over here and grab one. I'm just actually about to do it because I've got a walnut box there. I've got to put a hinge on. So this uh, one of my favorite box I've built in a long time. This is this is English walnut with holly. I hate to call them fake dovetails, but they are. They're not really. They're splines. So he's asking me, how do you match this up? How do you match the end of your dowel to that? And um, if you want, you can set up your router and literally just turn the end of the dowel. Uh, against the spinning quarter inch or eighth inch diameter uh, router bit, but then to get it close, I actually used it. I, I sanded it. I put the piece of dowel, put the piece of dowel into an electric drill, and then use the sandpaper to shape it, and then have a, another piece of wood that you've stopped the router bit in, so that you could actually then go in and check it to get it to fit. I've also done the lathe before, stuck it in the end of a, in a Jacob's chalk and just come in there and turned it. But then you still end up shaping it with sandpaper to get it perfect. It's not that difficult. It's not. You just have to guess. So what I end up doing is I get as, because if you'll notice, the size has to be precise. So I'll get it round and really close, but it's still a bit long. And then I'll come back in here and I'll cut some off of this joint in order to get it to fit just right. That way I don't have to mess around. I don't have to mess around trying to get the round part to fit and the length to fit at the same time. Next, Frick. Any more, any, excuse me, any more vets for uh, Ken? Uh, Pete Ambrose. Pete, all the way down in uh, Mrs. Alabama, Mississippi. Mississippi, Alabama, Mississippi. He's in Mississippi. I'm, I'm, that's my final answer. Pete's in Mississippi. Great to hear. Great to see you, Pete. That it. How are how's our uh, how's our auction going, Ken Frick? Uh, the saw is at two fifty. Plane is still at twelve ninety nine. From what I gather. Come on, guys. That's a great deal on a dovetail saw. Oh. Yeah, it is. Next. Uh, this one comes from Eric Babula in the chat. Hey, Eric. How long did you practice dovetails before you became comfortable to use them in a project? Half an hour? <laughs> well, um, when I started, oh, remind me to do a little lecture on 
blue chip and also talk about donations. I cut my very first dovetail in 1983. And I uh, was terribly nervous. Oh, couldn't stand the thought of failing. Didn't have anybody to teach me. I learned how to do it out of, out of the book, uh, Encyclopedia Furniture Making by Ernest Joyce. Although I modified it a little bit because I wasn't quite convinced with the way that he did one particular part, opinion. And I, the first thing I built was a coffee table for a, a beginning woodworking class I was taking in, at BYU. And uh, it had four drawers, and I cut the dovetails. And I was so proud of them. Oh, my goodness. I look at it now, and I think, oh, they were terrible. I wish I could find it and burn it. So I spent a long time. I would say that, um, but then I was, my interest level was extremely high, so I was determined. I used, to go to the, I used to go to school every morning. I was the assistant. I was the shop assistant, so I had the keys. So I would go in at 6 o'clock in the morning before school would start, and I would cut a row of dovetails. I can't remember now. It's been, that's 40 years ago. I don't remember how long that went on, but I just kept doing it until I could get, I could do it until I could get it so that it fit beautifully, and then I kept doing it so I could get fast at it. So, but here's the, here's the, uh, the topic of this month's newsletter. It's going to be learning how to cut uh, kind of dovetails that uh, Brett cut or the kind of dovetails that Justin cut or Marshall or Philip, or Omar. These, you're looking at, with the exception of one of these, you're looking at first-time dovetails. If you have a saw like this, 70% of the deal is done because the saw will cut laser straight. It doesn't matter who's using it. It'll cut laser straight. Straight is defined as the shortest distance between two points. So you aim it and you start. And because it cuts laser straight, it's going to leave you a flat surface. Let me show you what I mean. In order to get a good glue joint, you have to have two flat surfaces touching. So, if you can't do that, where's my saw? If you can't do that on your own, meaning if your saw doesn't cut nice and straight on its own and you've got to steer the cut, chances are you're not going to get it and you're going to have to come in there and try to fix it with a... Uh, Fix it with a chisel, and that's a recipe for disaster. So if your saw will cut perfectly <coughs> straight, so you just make a cut in the board, go down as far as it'll go. Then you're going to take a straight edge. And we're going to put that straight edge beside that cut, and we're going to see, is it straight? It certainly appears to be, meaning it's not wavy at all may not be perfectly plumb, although it looks pretty good. So I'm going to now remove that piece, cut it right here. Remind me what the question was? I can't Frick? remember. Oh, how long you practice? Oh, yeah, right, 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 yeah. And so what I'm getting at is we've developed tools now. So here you have two pieces. When they go back together, their fit will determine how good your joint looks. And if we spin it around, it should still fit well. So now you've got a nice flat surface. So when your tail comes up against your pin, you get a really nice fit. See that? Nice fit right from the saw. If I had to go in there and try to manipulate that with a chisel and try to get that good of a fit, you're fighting grain direction. Chisel control, chisel preparation, chisel sharpening. Chances are it's not going to turn out very nice. So, we now produce a saw that in anybody's hands, skilled or not, it will cut laser straight. Why? Because of the teeth and the set, very narrow set, just two thousandths of an inch. Half the thickness of a piece of paper. That's all they stick out on this side. Half the thickness of a piece of paper is all they stick out on that side. Just enough clearance to allow the blade to slip through the wood. Controls it so it will not drift to the left or to the right. Nice and straight. Now you add in... Now I'm telling you why it took me so long and why these guys can pull it off so quickly. So here's two more tools 
that really are the make or break. This is the exact same thickness as that saw blade. So after you've cut your dovetail, see when you get this far, you, you, don't, get a, you don't get a pat in the back because this is just a template. Now I've got to cut pieces to fit in these spaces once they're removed. And we used to take that out and take that out and take that out and cut this off, cut that off. And we would take a knife. If you're really serious about cutting dovetails, I would suggest you pay very close attention to what I'm about to say. Because it's, uh, it's the reason why you'll be able to do this. We would put our tailboard in the vise. We'd set this up. And we would go in with a knife. And we would carefully trace that tail and pin. Now, you can say, well, why don't you push harder so I can see it? Well, the harder you push it, the wider it is, the less accurate it is. The finer the line, the better. But now you've got to come in there with your saw and your bad eyes and try to find that. I would have my bench lamp playing around with it and try to get, oh, there it is. And once you get it, now you've got to sneak up on it and try to get it just close enough, but not too close. Wasn't easy. In fact, when you consider the fact that you might have to do that 12 times on one joint, chances are you're going to miss one or two or 10. Instead, this is how we do it now. Thanks to Sean McDermott, the genius that invented this. Sean's one of our combat wounded vets. He's usually on. We, just, we match up the width of our saw curve. Mine happens to be 24 thousandths of an inch. So this little piece of brass has a, is very precisely made. My friend in Ontario, Paul, makes these for us. So the difference between this surface and that surface is 24 thousandths of an inch. So I put this like that. I put my second piece in here, and I hold that just like that. Now that's securely held. This sawtooth blade, uh, this dovetail mark knife, has a blade in it that is the exact same thickness as that dovetail saw that I just used. So when I put this dovetail sawtooth blade down in there, see how it just fits? It can't move left or right. It can only go and follow the cut. Now, I'm not going to explain to you all the which way you move it and whatever, but let's just tell you this. What that does is I drag that through multiple times, depending on the species. I would, I would then mark... I marked the right side of this tail, I'd mark the right side of that tail, and I marked the right side of that tail, and then I would move this the other way. That's why you can then swing it around so that this is now 24 thou off of that. You put it like this and you move it over. So now you're going the opposite direction, and I would come in with that same sawtooth blade, and I would do the other side of each tail, and I would reach down in and drag it through. Move dummy. But here's the big advantage. When it comes time to now cutting my pins, which is so critical because these have to fit what I've already cut. Instead of trying to guess where to put my saw, look at this. You just put your saw and you set it in the curve. Literally, it's the same size. It's set, you put it right in the curve and then you just make your cut. Don't make it on an angle like that. They gotta be plumb. I guess my board's kinda cockeyed. I'll use that as an excuse. So, you, starting today, have the ability to get the right tools, follow the technique that I've developed, and within a week, you will cut dovetails better than I did after my first six months. Guaranteed. Look at these. Come close. <clears throat> Come close. Let's give, them a real, let's, let's give them a real good shout out. First, first class we ever taught at Combat Wounded Vets had Philip Gustafson from New York and Marshall Rommel from Seattle or Washington State. And this was their first joint, and I was thoroughly impressed. I actually managed to get them to give them to me. And he was, Philip was very quick. Now, here's Brett's. The opposite. Brent's. Brent's. Not so quick, but very good. Look at that closely. And here's Omar. Omar. Army, e uh, pardon me, Navy, sorry, Omar. Navy EOD, Explosive Ordnance Disposal. Blown up severely. Lost one leg. Most of all the meat off the other leg lost this finger and this part of his hand, blew away all the flesh off of this arm, took out his elbow. They built him a new elbow. These bottom two fingers didn't work at all because there was nothing left down in here. These fingers were all mangled. 
and he was able to pull off that. That was his first dovetail. That is remarkable. Omar, amazing. Call me, would you, if you happen to see this? I, I need to talk to you. Yes, Ken? Uh, Kyle's on. Kyle Parallel? Parallel. Par Parnell. Par Kyle up in Newfoundland. He's probably frozen to death. <clears throat> Kyle, buddy? And Mr. and Mrs. Claus are on. Oh, Mr. and Mrs. Claus. And she's I won't said, take my hat off. All hair fall out. She <laughs> said that she'll match, they'll match up to $1,500 on the plane. On the plane? Wasn't that nice of them? Mm. Thank you. Um... Uh, so, yeah, back to the, finish off the dovetail question. If you're serious about long and cut dovetails, then pay attention to what I just said. And, you know, you can say, oh, Rob's just selling saws. Whatever. Do you want to learn how to do it? Pay attention to what I, what I just told you, and you will be able to. You can fight with the old saw that you have, even a lot of the ones that are out there now. You'll fight with them. I know. I made my saw simply because the ones I was selling, 60%. Of the people that bought it could never get it to start accurately. And if you can't get it to start accurately, you're lost. Mine have these little tiny teeth up front, the first two inches. The little small teeth allows you to get it started precisely. Then, boom, away you go and lots of speed. Yada, yada. Frick, next question, please. Next one comes from <clears throat> Jumping Jacks in the chat. Jumping Jacks. He says, what are the most requested items that you make in your shop? What are the most requested Items that you make in your shop. Ken? Dovetail saw. Yeah, dovetail saw is number one. Uh, our saws really put us on the map. I'll give you the, I'll see if we can't get between, between uh, Jake and Ken and I, try to give you the top three. Dovetail saw would be number one that we make here. Shooting board fit in the top three, Ken? No. No? What's next? Uh, join the crosscut, Jake? Things that we make, that's what you're yeah. talking about. Are you talking volume or? No, well, yeah, volume. Oh. Kerfix 10? 10 yeah. Chisels? <clears throat> yeah, Kerfix 10. Chisels, dovetail markers, um, shooting boards, mallets. <clears throat> well, at least I can give you number one. Number one is a dovetail saw. It's still our, it's still our number one seller um, year after year. So that means there's an awful lot of, there's hundreds and hundreds of people that are becoming good dovetailers every day. Next, Frick. I forgot to mention, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Claus are here. You did. We already know. Ken I, told us. Oh, I wasn't paying attention. And they're matching up to, to $1,500 the plane and the as a donation to PHP. <clears throat> awesome. Our regular donations are up to... Regular donations are up to $1,063. 1063 Okay, we got to bump that up. So here, i got, I got two things I need to talk to you about. So bear with me for a minute. You know why we do this? Uh, since 2016, we have, each year, we've hosted a number of combat wounded veterans from uh, one, two, three, four, five different countries, Jake? Five different countries. Yeah. As far away as Australia, Ireland... Denmark, you heard Sibby tonight, and the uh, United States and Canada. We, I think it's about 175 is how many we've brought here. When I say bring them here, we cover their airfare. We pick them up at the airport. We take care of their housing. We feed them all their meals while they're here. This is a six-day course. We send every vet home with 4,000 U.S. dollars worth of tools. So what you see behind me is what they take home. Planes, saws, chisels, stones, same stuff I use, exact same stuff. Then, thanks to Jack Lane and, uh, and uh, Jim up in Moncton and vol volunteers in how many different countries? Eight, nine? Mm, yeah, ten. There's well over 300, if not 400 volunteers of the Bench Brigade who actually procure the materials, build the bench to our spec, and then deliver it to one of those vets so that they have a workbench of their own to work on at home. It's a big endeavor. It's an expensive endeavor, and it's only getting more expensive. We don't scrimp anything. Anita and, and uh, my wife, Kim, and my daughter, Erica, and my daughter-in-law, Megan, and uh, some other volunteers um, next door, Teresa works next door, 
make the very best meals using the best ingredients. Is You can't go to a restaurant after you've been here because it's subpar. So, you want to help? You want to participate? You want to feel really good about doing something, knowing that you're actually helping someone who put it on the line for us? <laughs> then I would suggest that you donate. If you're in the United States, you can now get a tax receipt for it. We are a 501c3, um, whatever that stands for. Nonprofit. Section of the tax code, but it stands for nonprofit non charity. Right. We're working on the same thing for Canada, which may be another four or five months, and we'll be able to do it. Um, our cost estimate right now is about $350,000 a year U.S. to run our program. And we're not going to let it fall because we didn't collect enough money. We will cover it where it needs to be covered. Last year, we were able to raise enough to pay for two of the six classes and the airfare. Jake, correct me if I'm wrong. The airfare for the vets in the other classes. So we've got a ways to go. Need your help. Need your help. Um, nobody takes a salary from this. Luther volunteers a ton of time. Uh, we do pay our kitchen staff because they're also preparing food for the seven civilian students that come here as paying students, to which we are grateful because not only do they help cover the costs through their tuition, but they also add to the success of the program in helping these combat wounded veterans. All right, switching gears a little bit. Now, when we come, when they come, I tell them, the only thing you owe us for having us bring you here is you owe us a replacement. So everybody gets what's called a blue chip. And that simply means that you, better than we, know who should be here, who needs the benefits of this class. If we don't have that, then we simply answer. We get applications online. We read what the individual has written. We have no idea who they are. We just hope that what we're reading is as is, as at face value. The way it should work is, now that we have 175 alumni, we should never be having to take a cold recruit ever again. All of these people coming to this year should be coming to us because some vet has reached out to someone he knows and said, you really need this. I'm going to blue chip you. It's almost a guarantee that you're going to get in if another vet that has been to the program has stepped up and said, I vouch for this individual. He needs it. I think of, uh, I, I don't want to call them out because if I do, I'll miss somebody. But we've got a handful and I'm thinking their name, so help maybe telepathy will take it to the individual so they know. We've got some guys that have really taken that to heart, and they are always on the lookout. And, you know, the, the, I just put the smile on my face when I read the application, and it says, so-and-so recommended this to me. They said, I need this class. You guys are doing your job. It's really your job. We, 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 all we can do is read an application. We have no idea. Does this person really qualify? But when you say they do, it's gold. Done. Over. So please, if you're one of our combat vets, and we actually give that same blue chip to the students because after a week of being here, they know and they see and they recognize. So you guys are our ears and our eyes. We need you to find these broken soldiers that need us. How many, Jake? On this first four classes... We're, uh, that means four, 28 wounded vets that are coming in. How many are blue chip? I think there were eight. Okay, so out of 20, what they say? Eight. Out, out of 28, eight are blue chip. That means we had to pick 20 out of the dark. So that's, that's, not, uh, that's not where I wanted this to be. So would you please double your efforts, quadruple your efforts, and those of you who are doing it, salute. Thank you. You're part of it. You're part of the solution. And I'm going to say this. If you need to talk to somebody about it, you can call me. You can call me. If you want to talk to somebody about someone you have, call me. I'm going to give you my, my cell phone, 506-977. I don't care. 1401. That's my cell phone. You're a combat wounded vet, and you're not sure about this blue chip or somebody, and you need to talk to somebody, you're welcome to call me. I just gave you my number. Not ringing. <laughs> Got more vets. Okay, more vets. Uh, Je Jesse Rufins is on. Hey, Jess. Oh, I got to throw this out to Jesse Rufins. Best craftsman I know. 
the best, absolutely the best, and I know a lot, best craftsman I know. He makes our panel gauges, our winding sticks, our dovetail markers, our drawer dovetail markers, our drawer bottom planes, and everyone comes in precise. Excellent craftsman. Canadian combat window vet, first of two, he and Kyle were the first two Canadian vets we had back in 2017. Just lives across the pond. On a good day, I can actually see Nova Scotia across the Bay of Fundy. I'd like to point out that Kyle in that same class with him would probably be a distant second in terms of craftsmen. <laughs> <laughs> and Royce Atcherberg, 2000. Royce, brother! I was going to text you the other night. So Royce just had major surgery. And uh, I, I was communicating with him back and forth afterwards. I'm, I'm, the fact that I, I'm so glad to hear that you're here. I will text you tonight. Just to catch up and make sure you're all right, brother. Al McNeil's on. Who? Al. Al Norman McNeil. Al McNeil. Norman Al. That kind of sounds like a tank. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Big Al. This is, this is, uh, this is my 105, 100, 105 millimeter anti-tank round. Fin stabilized Sabo. I don't think they can see it. That was Al's. This was Al's first round that he fired as a tank commander, Canadian Strathconus. He didn't have the uh, wooden end. No. They, they <laughs> well, used, Canadian budget's pretty use, fine, so they use foam we shoot now. walnut. <laughs> <laughs> Nerf gun. So Al came to us. Al's been here two years? A lot more than that, three, I think. Three. How long's Al been out around, Jake? He's reading comments. Al's been here at least two years, maybe three. Works here a couple days a week, three if I need him. He's our guy. He's the guy that can fix anything. His solution is get a bigger hammer. <laughs> but Al fixes all. Al, I give Al a piece of machinery, and I, it doesn't even matter if he's never seen that, that thing before. When I come back, it'll be all done up. Awesome. So Al and Ken and I are uh, starting a chapter of something called Sleep in Heavenly Peace. This is a program to build beds for children that do not have a bed to sleep in. And Al and I are going to a meeting out in Alberta, uh, middle of next month. And uh, Al promised me that if he, because the Strathconas are from out there in Edmonton, Al promised me he's taking me for a ride in a Leopard. I don't know if it's going to be Leopard 1 or Leopard 2. That's a Canadian tank, so I'm looking forward to that. We're actually going to go a day early. Al, holding you to it. Anyone else, Ken? Eric Everhard. Eric, Ebby, down in uh, Georgia, Atlanta. I think he moved there. He's EOD. He's there. I think he's Air Force EOD. Haven't heard from him in a while. Ebby, how are you? I hope you're doing well, brother. Anyone else? That's it. Frick, question? Uh, yep. What? Uh, Mahesh Chander in the chat. Mahesh? How do I adjust the set on your saws? I've sharpened too many times and now the set is too little. And all the saw sets I can buy are too big. Well, um, where are we, Chris? We're trying to get a saw set made that will, and, and all of our saws, no, that's not true. These have 3,000 set per side. All the rest of our saws are 2,000. So I don't need multiple different settings. So Chris is working on, and hopefully we'll eventually have our own saw set that will enable you to do that. Um, what you're probably going to have to do is buy a, buy a saw set. You may have to follow, you may have to actually go in there and modify that pin. So a saw set looks like this. And when you... When you uh, put this down on your blade, like so, it rests there. There's an anvil. On this one, there's an anvil. And as you rotate that anvil, the angle gets more severe. So at the highest point, um, what happens is there's kind of a two-stage plunger when I pull that trigger. The first one pushes the blade tight against the anvil. The second one pushes a little plunger that then pushes on the tooth up against the angle on the face of that ang anvil. You may have to go in and file that little pin so that it only touches one tooth instead of accidentally touching 
two or three at a time because they're so small. Uh, now, this guy actually sent this to us. Do you remember who it was? No. Shoot. Sorry. And what he did to modify it was he put this in there. So in, because, because the, uh, the set was, the anvil was not shallow enough, he put this in. It's adjustable so that that prevents the, uh, that plunger from pushing the tooth all the way against the anvil, which would give you more set than you want. So if you can see how that's been done, right, and it's adjustable, you can turn that out, he's brazed two nuts together. So if you can't do it, you can always send it to us and we'll do it, but it, uh, what I was going to say, that if you don't have something like this, and you set it as minimally as you can, then you may have to go in and, re and take some of that set off after the fact. How would I do that? Well... If I've got too much set, and I'm going to base that by determining when I make a saw cut, I don't want any slop in there. So if I've got too much slop, then I'm going to take my stone. I would prefer to use a diamond plate, because the way it wears better. And I would set the, the blade down on the diamond plate with my thumb right here. Jake, are they able to see this? The Suno, Sunos were coming to Florida. I, remind me to mention that, please. Okay. Can you find those dates? It's the first, the last weekend in March and the first weekend in April. Just so I have them. Okay, so what I'm doing, I hold my thumb right here, and I drag it like this, and then I flip it over, and I repeat that process, holding my thumb right here, and I drag it on the stone like so. Then I'll go over and I'll make a test cut. Now, when I make my test cut, I'm watching for two things now. I'm watching for a nice straight cut. I'm, locked, I'm watching for a narrow curve. And I want to make sure that my blade doesn't have a tendency to drift to the left or to the right. If it drifts to the left, then I need to take more set off of the left side. That's creating more freedom for the saw. So the saw wants to go path of least resistance. So if, the, if I was drifting to the left, I would go to the left side of the blade and I would pull, make an extra one pass. I never do more than one before I come back and check it. And when I no longer have any drift, I'll just keep doing that until I get the amount of the, the kerf, the exact width that I want, which is just literally two thou, three thou, four thou, somewhere in that neighborhood. And that's how I would do it. But you're right, every time you show, you got to remember that that tooth is bent from the base of it out. So every time you sharpen, you're, you're going to take that, you know, the tooth is sticking out here. Every time you sharpen, you're going to take some more off of this, more off of this, more off, and eventually you're going to get right back into here where there's no set on at all. So, But, I mean, I tell people, if you're, you're dovetailing on the weekends three times a month, you're going to, you might get three years between sharpening, so... You don't need to sharpen it as often as I think some people would assume. It's not like a plain blade or a chisel. Yep, who we got, Ken? Uh, Mrs. Kloss just wrote this note on the, in the chat. Okay. Hold on just one second before you read. Can you hear him, Ken? Rick? I just hold the bike a little bit closer to your mouth there, Ken. Okay. Mrs. Kloss said, okay, Rob, Santa now has a lump in his throat after you spoke on the veterans. As you know, Santa is a Vietnam vet. He is so devoted to your program, we're going to sponsor in full two vets in fall classes. Pardon? Going to sponsor two vets in full in the fall class. Thank you. And the uh, Florida thing is uh, March 29th is a Friday. Is it a Friday and a Saturday? Or yeah. Saturday? So March, uh, March 29th this year. Not, what's March 29th? Is that a Friday? That's Friday. Friday. And the 30th. And the 30th, I'm going to be uh, teaching at the uh, Woodcraft store in, help me. Orlando, Florida. 
So we're going to do one day class on sharp on everything to do with planing, setting up your plane, sharpening your plane, uh, using a shooting board, and then on uh, fr on Saturday we're going to do a all day dovetail seminar on everything about dovetails. Through dovetails in the morning, half blinds in the afternoon. And you're not going to be at a bench. It's going to be kind of a seminar, but I will get audience participation, and I promise you'll walk away. Uh, I think it's I think it's $195 tuition each day. It includes your lunch. Uh, there's limited seating, obviously. And if you do both classes, there's a discount coming in. I think $350 if you do if you decide you want to do both classes. Now that's that's settled for the Orlando store. I'm hoping to do the same thing at the uh, store in Tampa. In Cle Tampa, Clearwater Beach. At the April 5th and 6th. At the April 5th. Now you'll have to contact the stores directly. We'll put out an email about that. We're just, we're just in the process of nailing down all the deets on it. Plus a meet and greet with Frick. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's included in the tuition. No extra charge. No, no charge. Yeah, you might be able to get yourself a, a freaking good barbecue t-shirt. I'm there because I have to drive. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're going to have some free draws. I'm going to send down some tools that we can give away, and we'll have a good time of it. Sue will be there. Sue B, yep. Oh, she'll be there. Yeah. All right. Next. Uh, okay. This is from Gary Wayne Bow in Northeast Arkansas. He says, I'm starting a woodworking shop. I'm a retired Army veteran, and I'm interested in starting a program to help veterans start woodworking. Do you have any advice? Sorry. Read it again for me, please. He says, I'm starting a woodworking shop. I'm a retired Army veteran, and I'm interested in starting a program to help veterans start woodworking. Do you have any advice? Wow. We're going to unpack that. Where is he? Northeast Arkansas. Northeast Arkansas. And I'm going to ask you to read me one more time so I can digest all this. So he's starting a woodworking shop to help veterans start woodworking. Yeah. He's a retired Army veteran. Yeah. So he's interested in starting a program to help veterans start woodworking, and do you have any advice? Yeah, uh, the best advice I could give you would be to come to one of our classes. Come and, uh, and see how we do it. We've got a guy coming from Israel uh, who contacted us wanting to do the same thing over there. Of course, there's going to be lots of wounded vets. So he's coming sometime this summer, and I said, you know, come in and, uh, and observe. And I would say the same thing for you. I mean, I don't know what bit of advice I could give you. Find yourself a Santa Claus... But um, if you could get yourself here, contact us off. Contact us and uh, contact me directly. Rob at robcosman.com. Okay? Rob at robcosman.com. Contact me directly and I'll, I'll see what I can do to steer you. This guy in the chat who wants to know the cost for a vet on average, I may join the classes with one myself if I can afford it. Oh, wow. Uh, Jake? I think, I think uh, each class... Of seven is 50, 51,000 or something like that? Each, I think he was talking. Each. Yeah, so I'm just going to divide the number. About $7,000? $7, yeah, a little better than $7,000 per vet. That covers everything that, that uh, we do for them. So as you can see, that was quite a, that was quite a donation, Santa Claus. I just come to expect it from him. He gets it. He gets it. And he's a Vietnam vet himself, so put all that together. Next, Frick. Uh, next one comes from Dan Vasquez in Jefferson, New Jersey. Hi, Dan. He says, when building shelves, when would one use sliding dovetails instead of dados? Uh, wow. When building shelves, read it to me again, please. When building shelves, when would you use sliding dovetails instead of dados? Uh, I, I wouldn't use sliding dovetails. It, it's, it's one of those things that's a good idea, but it's not always easy to execute. You can't... Uh, the go-no-go -go on the fit has to be so precise. The problem is you have to assemble it from one end. So if it's 12 inches wide, you've got to slide a perfectly fitting male portion of the dovetail through the female portion, and now and put glue on it. So the whole thing is starting to swell. 
what ends up happening is you destroy the piece trying to pound it together because although it fit perfectly dry, now you put some glue on there and it starts to swell and it doesn't work the same. What I used to do was assemble it halfway and then go in and glue the, this half and that half and hopefully it would go together before everything blew apart. Instead of trying to move it 12 inches, you're only having to move it six. What are you gaining with it? I don't think you're gaining enough to justify the work. You know, it's always, it's one of those things where, you know, I will take the time to cut dovetails because it's shown. As soon as, you, oh, remind, remind me to show them our locking system, please. You see the dovetail every time you open the drawer, every time you look at the cabinet. But when you consider the fact that this thing is never going to be seen, yes, you could leave it so that you see it at the front. But I don't think they're worth the bother. I really don't. It's just... Uh, it's, it's, there's, there's as good a way of doing it that requires a lot less effort and beating. But boy, I'm telling you, even though, even with clamps set up, sometimes you got to pull so hard on that, you're destroying, literally destroying the wood. So I, I've never been a big fan of sliding, sliding dovetails. And for that reason, for, I need you with the camera. Next. I want, I want to give you the update on our, uh, on our tool cabinet because we solved the big problem that we've been fighting with for a long time. Uh, donations are just under 1700 just so you know. Okay. Uh, I, got, I had a bunch of people uh, through the mailing list ask uh, if the IBC plane and chip breaker blades are going to be available again. I'll let Jake answer that. You got a camera, Jake? I get a Possibly. Camera. Come on, be more specific than that. If I say yes, what's their next question? When? When? Exactly. I don't know when. But we, there are, they are, they are in the process of being made. We encouraged allegedly. Our, allegedly, they are in the process. I would say that within the next month, you could quite possibly see them. Okay, let's. Do All right. So here, so uh, Frick, anything? I take a break. Yo, yeah. Yep. Okay. So. Uh, if, in case you're not up to speed on this, our current project in the online workshop, and I'm going to do a little promo here. Jake and I, you, you said 2010. We started that in 2011. We didn't start 2010. Right, Frick? Sorry, can you repeat that? Online workshop, we started in 2011. July of 2011, yeah. Yeah. So, and the idea was um, to, teach people, uh, to teach people how to build furniture. Most people that get into this as a hobby have no instruction. They may be lucky to see some videos, possibly read a book, but no hands-on. So we decided the bandwidth was there that we could do it. So we started we started with very, uh, simple projects, and we'd show them how to do all this stuff, and we just kept going, and it's still going. We, we now do three 45-minute episodes each week, with the exception of when we run the class, and we compensate for that. Anyway, so this is what we're doing right now. So if you're a wounded vet, you get that service for life for free. If you're not, it's 250 a year, I think. And you get access to all of the episodes that have been filmed. So there's over 3,000 on there. And there's probably 50 plus projects from shop furniture to a dining room table to uh, everything you can imagine. Moosey, this is a good time to be. <laughs> so here's what we did. You shouldn't talk to senior citizens like that. <laughs> <laughs> They don't know that little moose is here. Yeah, that's... <laughs> well, I figured they knew it wasn't big moose that was going, eh, eh. <laughs> well. <laughs> so, prototype first. This is the tool cabinet. We are going to build it, fill it. You're going to help me fill it. And then we're somehow going to figure out a way to give it to somebody. And those proceeds will fund the heart project. So, here's where we are. This wing is completed except it hasn't been hinged on there. It'll sit there like so. There's a couple of pieces missing out of here, but there's a six inch square there and a two inch square there. I gotta show you that in case I haven't already. What's neat about that is, yeah, there's magnets, but the magnets are in back, so you don't see them. They don't show up on the surface, but they're in there. So when that goes in place, that holds nicely. And that holds nicely. Oh, That's not in. There. Does it 
chisel missing out of here. There's your, there's your six inch square there. There's another marking gauge that goes in right there. So I'll show it the whole thing. There's your, there's your 12 inch square sits down in that slot, six inch there. Mm -hmm. And then over here, you've got another, you got another wing. And this is our center section. And this is where the, the, the uh, this is Willie, my buddy Willie, made us the uh, brass stays. So this one will tilt out and hold your rip saw. This one tilts out and holds your cross cut. I'm going to put a bevel on here and a bevel on there. And then that slips down in there. And that's... What's that hitting? I don't know. It slips up the sides of it there. We're, we're still fine-tuning. And then your other tools are going to be in here. So here's the drawers. And we wanted, we wanted to be able to lock the drawers because when these doors close, you don't want people having access to this. I'm trying to figure out how we're going to do this. So here's what we came up with. The five and a half... And that's all leather lined. And I, I really like the fact that it's leather lined because then when you set the plane on there, it's just nice and quiet. Now, the block plane is going to sit in behind here and the, and the uh, shoulder plane is going to sit in here. But we didn't want to be reaching down in there to grab it. So there's actually going to be a little platform, a raised platform. Walnut will come up and go over the back and they'll sit there. But we had to come up with a way to lock these doors. So here's what we did. This will be threaded. This brass rod will be threaded, and on the top side there'll be a knob. Now, one of the somebody get left a comment uh, just today. We should make it a little adjuster instead of a brass knob. You know, a, a, oh, our yeah. adjuster. So when this raises up, you can open your drawers, all of them. When this cloak goes down, the drawers are locked. You can't open any of them. Oh, wait a minute. Why is that one? There, sorry, that's locked. So I'll lift it up. So in the back, there's a little brass inlay with a hole in the middle. I still gotta flush that off a little bit more. And this pin, real simple, on a bit of an angle, sits in a piece of blood wood for some extra weight. And that just drops down in there. Now, when you, when you spin your little knob on the top, it'll hold it up like that so you can use your drawers. When you're done, you loosen the knob, it drops down like that, and now the doors are secured. And by the way, if you haven't already seen this before, in order to better utilize your drawer, we have a little removable tray with nice little dovetails on there. That way you don't have a whole bunch of junk in there that you can't find. You've got one layer there, and this allows you to have another layer on the top side. Each tray, each tray is a little bit different. That's a single, this is a triple, and this is one big open tray. Remember, we, you and I, are going to fill that with tools. No rush. We're working away on it, but we're getting close. All dovetailed. I don't know if you noticed the through wedge tenons on the construction, the dovetails on the corners. It's going to be lovely. Be hard to part with. Next, Frick. Um, this one comes from Luter in the chat. Luter? Luter, yeah. He, yeah. Luter. He says, I'm building a... Quilt clamp to hang my wife's quilt. Pendleton, Pen Pendleton, but my curly maple isn't long enough. I need to cut two strips, two strips of four feet, and combine end frame to end grain to make a six foot piece. Should I use a lap joint or a different joint? How big is this piece that we're joining? Any idea? He needs to make a. He said two, he's cutting two strips of four feet. Needs to make a six foot piece. Yeah, I know, but I don't know how big the piece is. I mean, if you're trying to, if you're trying to do two little skinny pieces and make a long poise, it's going to be a little bit tougher. If it's fairly wide, I mean, you commercially where they use a finger joint, so you have a long tapered joint that gives you lots of glue surface and makes for a really strong. In fact, usually under those circumstances, the joint, the piece of wood will break somewhere other than the actual joint. If you're doing it by hand. That would be a task, but possible. Um, I don't know. How, I, I see. I don't know how much stress you're going to apply to it. You could just do a lap joint. 
and uh, a lap joint glued. I would probably, dip, again, I don't know the size, but I would probably do a, uh, um, you know, a, uh, an open mortise where you have, if I can do this, you know, make one piece like this and then the other piece Do this. He said it's three inches wide. Okay, if it's three inches wide, then I I would probably do something like this. Three quarter thick. Three quarter thick. Yeah, that only gives you a quarter. Uh, how could you divide that up? That might be enough. Yeah, again, it all depends on how, where the stress is, but I would probably maybe join something like that, and then you could only you not only could you glue it, but you could put a couple of dowels in there too pin it to help hold it you need to you need to know how much stress it's going to be under and under what force is it going to be is it going to be uh, a tensile strength I meaning it's going to be trying to pull apart like that is it going to be pressure like this that would all come into into play but you want to get you want to get glue surface and you want to try to keep the same amount of wood on both pieces that's the downside to uh, the, the upside to a lap joint is you're taking the same amount off of both pieces, but you've only got one glue surface. That one increases your glue surface, but now you've reduced your three-quarter piece down to just a quarter, whereas the other's a half. Tough one. Need to know a little more or help you any better. Any more vets? Rick, question? Uh, yeah, just to give an up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, from what I have here, the plane is at 1501, the saw is at 500, so we have uh, about 10 minutes left, so if you want to okay. bid, make sure you do that. The donations uh, are at? Ken? Donations, Ken? You asked me a question while we're waiting on that first? Sure. John Root 22 and... 11. How much? 2211. 2211? John Root in Greenbrier, Arkansas says, why does wood become hard and brittle when it's older? Is there a way to better work with it? Why does wood become hard and brittle when it's older? I don't know if that's necessarily a factor of age. Uh, I would say that's probably more uh, environmental conditions. It may be, I mean, brittle because it really gets dried out. Um I mean, most every board in this shop is probably 100 years old if you actually consider the age of the tree. Some of, it, some of the stuff in here is even older than that since it's been cut. Uh, ask me the question again, please, Frick. He just asked, why does it become hard and brittle when it's older, and is there a, a way to better work with it? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily think that it has anything to do with age as much as it does just the conditions that it's been in. So if it's been really dried out, then that's probably more likely what uh, has caused it to become brittle. But I don't know if I would work it any differently. I'm trying to think of anything I've done with some really old wood. Nothing is coming to mind. Yeah. I mean, if it's if it's dry and if it's really dry and brittle, then you just can't work very small pieces. You got to keep it. Fairly substantial. It's like when we were when we were making. Uh, I love torrified wood because it's stable, and I love the color. But it really, really weakens it. So we used to sell our dovetail saws in a wooden box that had little maple toggles that were shaped like a dovetail. They were an eighth of an inch thick. And they were probably that long, and at the widest point, they were that wide, and they tapered down to about an eighth of an inch. And there's no way you could take one of those maple and snap it in your fingers. Same thing made out of torrified maple. You could go break it in half like that. That was a real shock. I had no idea that it weakened it that much. So you're working with torrified. You never work with small. You never reduce it down to small pieces if it's going to be under any stress at all. You got to keep it fairly chunky. I would say the same thing applies to that if you're dealing with brittle wood. Next, Frick. All right, this one comes from... Uh, Did I cover everything that I asked you to remind me to cover? Did you get the blue chip? Did the blue chip? Yep. 
to Florida. Thank you. All right. Uh, this one comes from Gary Stevens in Pasco. What's WA? Washington? Washington, yeah. Washington, if you're Washington. from South Carolina. When you mark your pin board, you use your shoulder vise and align to your plane laying on its side on the bench top. How do you do this using the Moxon vise since it places the pin board high above the bench top? Well, maybe Jake should answer that question. No, but Jake did point it out earlier. Yeah. So we are about to release these. We've already sold some. We haven't even got them on the website, but Gina likes to do that. I should, I should give a big shout out to Gina and Pam because... Uh, Gina and Gina's in charge of customer service and all our shipping and Pam is her assistant and they have had a overload this last month orders up the yin yang and they managed to pull it all together and get orders out so thank you Pam thank you Gina we appreciate what you do and Gina is also on top of customer service she's probably watching tonight what was I just going to say? Oh, and, she's, and so she'll recommend something. That is, you know, well, we all, somebody was saying how uh, they didn't think they were going to be able to make a mox and vice themselves. She said, well, we've already got them made. So here's what we're going to sell you. It's made out of Baltic birch and poplar, and it's got our special kit in there. You just simply take it out of the box, clamp it onto your bench, open up the jaws, and away you go. Now, why am I saying this? Because it's asking about height. They're at, they're oh, asking. right, right. So if you if you've watched me cut dovetails, you know I always put my plane right here to set my the end of my tailboard on. So if I had something like this, what I would do, see so just uh, a clamp on either side. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a little sales pitch on this. Can't, who makes these? You? Kevin and I. Kevin? Kevin Lasky? Yeah. When he when he shows up. <laughs> so they are spring loaded that means as you wind these back the jaws come out you don't need that third hand it's lined with luther calls it crubber which is a cork rubber really nice grip and um, you're going to put your board in there that you're dovetailing willie puts these handles on there so it makes it so much easier to move now Oh, sorry, this is the wrong piece. Your pin board. I had a pin board that I already... Whatever, I'll just pretend. So how do I transfer the piece? I would simply cut a piece of material. I would probably have it a T-shaped. So flat piece with a piece in the middle sticking up that comes to this height. And you would then set that right here. And that's where you would rest your board on. So... The other end of your board would sit on that T, and that T is going to be this height, from here to there. And I, would, I, I wouldn't want to attach to here because I like to have it far away. So the most stable part, the most stable way to do that would be to make something that looks like this, right? So it sets, it sets, it sets in here. Don't need to be that wide. It's fastened like that so that this and this are at the same height, Wait. and then you can set your board right on it. Yeah, but that, you don't want it at that height. You want it taller than that. I want this height to be right to here. How does that work? Good question, Jake. What am I thinking? I know, what am I missing? It has to go up. However, because your board... Oh, is yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. That's right. And you have to Okay, back up, back up. You don't want, and you don't want to be hitting this with your, with your dovetail marking knife. And you have to set the board in the jaws... At that same height, so it can't, you can't have something. You're right. I got to think about it. I got to think about that. We're going to come up. Now that I, I, I wasn't thinking what, what Jake's talking about now, he said to me earlier, and it didn't register. So it's actually got to be up here. By the way, one of the advantages of shoot, of this uh, Moxon vise is it allows you to get three or four inches, maybe even not higher, so you're sawing, so you're not having to bend over. But like Jake said, in order to do that, if I'm marking on this piece... I'm using my sawtooth blade to come across here. I don't want to be dug getting into this, so I can't have it sitting down here. So what I told you earlier wouldn't work. We need to have it up higher. We need to have it up about here, which means this piece has to be this high. 
But the question is, if, it's, if you do that, and you've got your support piece back here, something like that, how are you going to know the height to get this to match it perfectly? So what we got to do is some figure out some way to reference this over to here. Yeah, we want something that's really fast so you can you know bring it right over and flush it up. Oh, I'll go to work on that. I'll go to work on that and come up with an idea. There's one out there. Just got to pull it in. Next question. Okay, last one. Why? It's 5-2. We've got draws to do. You always quit early. <laughs> uh, this one's from Chris de la Cerda in Roswell, New Mexico. Chris in Roswell, New Mexico or Georgia? New Mexico. Hi, Chris. He says, hey, Rob, I'm having problems with sharpening my plane blade. It's hollow in the middle. I don't know if I'm doing wrong at the bench grinder or at the sharpening stones. Thank you for your help. Well, bench, the bench grinder, you can only get close. Um, you're trying to, you're going to try to straighten an edge. See if I can grab one here. There's your plane blade, which is two and three eighths of an inch wide. This stone, that's actually not a stone, this is a CBN wheel, is an inch wide. So how am I going to, how am I going to put an edge, grind that edge and have it perfectly straight when I'm having to move it side like that, side to side in order to cover the entire width of the blade? Can't. But you're going to get close. How are you going to get close? You're going to practice and you're going to check it. You put your straight edge on there, your square, and if you're a little high here, you're going to go over and address it a little bit. Get yourself a CBN wheel. Why? Because they don't burn. They're very difficult to burn. And they cut really fast and nice and cool. So you're going to keep working on it until when you're doing this, it's square and it looks pretty straight. Straight, shortest distance from point to point. Okay, you want it to be straight along there, but then you want that straight edge to be square to the side. All right. Now, you should be able to remove on your bench grinder any, ma any macro errors. Now you're going to come over to your diamond stone, which is where, Jake? On the ground. In this pile of rubble. Oh, I don't remember doing this. Now, this is flat. So now I'm going to come on here. I'm going to lubricate that. I'm going to have four fingers covering the cutting, cutting the edge, covering the edge. And I'm going to press the same amount, with the same amount of effort on all four fingers. This is... This has to be learned because you will I want to press a lot harder with this finger than this pinky over here, but you have to learn to back that off. One of the things I like to do when I'm teaching this is uh, take, a, take a Sharpie and draw four circles. One, two, three, four. Now, one fingertip in each circle, okay? Now, think about that, same amount of pressure, find your primary bevel, come up a little bit higher, and start doing your little circles. Light, light, no real downward pressure at all. And if you do that, nice thing about the diamond stone, you can stay in one spot, you don't have to worry about moving from one end to the other to avoid wear. Just keep doing that, keep doing that, keep doing that. Another little help, try this. Try taking your same Sharpie and painting Painting this edge. Now, I wouldn't have any lubricant on here now because it'll make that come off. Now you can come in there, find your primary, come up a little higher, do one, two, three, four, five. Remember, light to moderate pressure. Flip it over, and you see how I have a nice line that goes all the way across? And you work until you get that. I'm not trying to remove all that black. I'm just making sure that right here at the cutting edge, I have an uninterrupted polished line. And if you notice, you got a hollow in the middle. Okay, if I got a hollow in the middle, is it severe enough that I should go over to the grinder and take away some of the high spot here and the high spot here? Or is it just barely? If it's just barely, then do it over here on your stone. But you got to have the right gear. People ask, you know, how come I can't do this? Well, are you using what I use? You're not? Then you're trying to make your work, your stuff, 
which may or may not work, do what I'm doing with my stuff. So I tell people, I said, look, if you want to be able to practice sharpen like I do, get the stuff that I use. If you buy the same gear I have, then all you have to do is apply what you're watching me do because you've eliminated one of the big variables. You know those stones we send you are going to work. It's that simple. Listen, you got to spend some money. Hate to break it to you, but you got to spend some money. If you want good results, get good equipment. It's so much easier and so much more fun. Eliminates so much of the aggravation. Any final questions, Frick? Nope. Nope. Let's give away some stuff. All right. So let's start with three. De- what, are, what, what are we giving away, Ken? Uh, I don't know. We're at 22, 32, 25. In the okay. Day. So we've got two main prizes to give away. We've got three dead cats to give away. Uh, where's, our, where's our auction? Um, I shouldn't be leaning on this. This is brand new. We're still at 1501 for the plane. I think I'll give this away. 510 for the saw. Pardon? Uh, 1501 for the plane, 510 for the saw. Okay. So we are going to... Uh, how, what, what, what's, what's cutoff time? The last thing we're going to do is call the winner on the plane and the saw. So you've got until, you've got until we're done... And that's not very long, so if you're interested, pony up. Okay, let's give away three dead cats. You want to model that, Chris? Well, I, I want to get a testimonial. It's always me. Can you give him the microphone? Does it work? Say something, for Chris. For Chris doesn't want to be seen. Can you hear him? <laughs> the dead cat is the first Tell the first you'll... story, yeah. The first thing you'll notice is how light it is, and you can't you 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 think how could this be warm? There's Thank nothing to it. He doesn't want to be seen. <clears throat> but when you put it on, it almost feels like there's a heater inside of it. It somehow reflects your own body <laughs> back at you. But yeah, it's it's warm. I think of the first time he got one, he called me up and he goes, "Is there a heater in this thing?" <laughs> then you get your brother-in-law, or somebody else. Yeah, my nephew, my brother-in-law. Yeah, it's great, and you got the big purple heart logo right on there too to help warm your heart. Okay, who are we giving them to, Frick? We're doing three. Three, yep. We always give away three. Thanks to Moose. All right, here we go. We didn't, we didn't discuss my hair. First one's going to William Knox in Ohio. William in Ohio, this time of year, you're going to love that dead cat. Number two is going to C.J. Weldy in San Diego, California. C.J., well, you know, San Diego gets cool. The nice thing about it is it, it works. I've worn mine out in minus 15 with the wind blowing. And, uh, and I've also warmed just on a cool night, so you'll like it. And number three is John Adams in Denver, Colorado. Definitely. You'll need it up 12, 11 months of the year in Denver. Been there. Okay. What now? Uh, well, we're going to give away two prizes. We, do, we, do, we give away a major prize for every $1,000 raised. So we're at 2000 and something, so we've got two prizes. I'm going to give away. I'm going to give away that mo- brand new Mox and Vice, all ready to go on your bench. And we talked so much about the dovetail saws tonight. I'm going to give away a dovetail saw. So you want to do the first draw for the Mox and Vice? Sure. Both valued. What's the what's the Mox and Vice? What's that valued at? Jake, what's the Mox and Vice? Three hundred fifty on Max and Vice, and the saws uh, two ninety five. And it's going to the Max and Vice is going to Cliff Salich in Georgia. <coughs> Cliff, congratulations, brother! And the dovetail saw. Dovetail saw is going to David Gadbury in Arkansas. David, enjoy it. Pick up a dovetail marking knife with a sawtooth blade and the Sean Shim to go with it. And by the way, we pay Sean McDermott. A royalty on every Sean Shim that we sell. Not only did we name it after him. Now, Frick, are you going to say something about the fundraiser with my hair before we uh, conclude? Well, I, I don't think we've chosen a date yet, but you might want to cut it before we go to Florida. So, do you want to set it two weeks from our next live? You... Well, what, what, you, what's the uh, goal? Well, we didn't really discuss that, but... Anyway, on our next live, we are going to tr- try to raise enough money... Uh, and if we do, we will cut Rob's hair live on the broadcast. Finally, but we haven't. Uh, if so, if you have any ideas and of what the, the funds limits go to, they go directly to the Purple Heart Project. Yeah, uh, and the and hair that, goes to. 
it goes to the uh, I don't know the exact organ. It goes towards cancer, does it not? Yeah, yeah. We make wigs out of it. Yeah, we don't have an exact organization, but yeah. And Debbie, who used to cut my hair, who lost her business because of the lockdowns, they used to rent a space to, is going to come on and do the chop chopping. I can't wait. <laughs> so we'll plan that two weeks from uh, tomorrow, I believe. Uh, well, you know, we, we should have, I thought we were going to have a goal in mind. And when the donations reach the goal, then we would do the cutting. Well, yeah, that is, but we just didn't come up with a number. Well, if then you, why, it, don't, why don't we let the audience, you guys suggest a number. What are these luscious locks worth? <laughs> now, just to be, give you an idea, the most we've ever raised on an episode, which I think was for your birthday, if I'm not mistaken. 30. Was, 30, uh, was 30,000. That's Quite a bit for hair, but, you know, we would... <laughs> you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can't get rid, get rid of it. I don't know. Well, you guys suggest to us, what, what's a worthy goal? You know where it's going. We're just having a little bit of fun with it. I'm getting 10K. So tell us, what should, we, what should we raise in order for me to get rid of this mess? Kyle says 10 grand. Kyle says 10. He's a small thinker. He's up in Newfoundland. He's on the rock. <laughs> Codfish, you know, screech. Codjigan. Yeah, you've been out codjigan? Do a little bit more. Get your number up. Okay. So do we have a we have a, a final bid a final who won who won the who won with the highest bid on the plane? Uh it looks like it's gonna be Robert Harms with uh fifteen twenty five. Hey Robert, thank you, brother. Certainly appreciate it. You're gonna love the plane. And if you won, uh just email Gina support at robcosman.com. And we got to figure out how we're doing the payment thing too, Ken. How are we doing that? Because that's a that's a PHP thing. So we don't want it running through our. Co- we'll figure it out. We'll let you know. We'll figure it out. Uh, who's who's getting the saw? Uh, John Bennett is getting the saw. John, you lucky devil. And he's getting it for five forty. Five forty. Where is he? I don't know, John. If you're still here, let us know where you're from. John Bennett from somewhere. Contact Gina. Support at robcosm.com, and we'll make the arrangements for payment and delivery. Oh, someone just outbid him. Sorry. <laughs> oh, somebody outbid him? Yeah, Rob Switzer, 550. Rob Switzer from Alberta? Uh, might be. Last chance, John, if you want to anyway, been... wrap it up, and I'll let you know. So we don't know who's got it? It's Rob right now. But that came in, and you didn't notice it? No, it just came in as we were kind of closing it off. Oh. That's a sniper. Must play hockey. All right. So unless something changes, I guess Rob, uh, I'm pretty sure it's Rob Switcher. I know Rob a long time in northern Alberta. I'm actually going to be in Edmonton. Should try to put something together. Uh, yeah, Big Al, Al the tank commander and I are going to be in Edmonton uh, middle of February for a couple of days. We're going out there. To start our chair, our do some training to start our chapter of Sleep in Heavenly Peace. I would highly encourage you to look that up, sleepinheavenlypeace.org. If you've got some woodworking skill, although it doesn't require a ton, but you really want to do something that is uh, extremely needed, extremely has an extreme need, and another one of those things that you just will love yourself for having been able to help in this type of a situation. Building beds for children who don't have a bed to sleep in. The demand is huge. We're starting the first chapter in Eastern Canada, and that's what we're in the process of doing right now. Okay, is that it? It is. Thank you for being with us tonight, folks. What, what was our number? How many did we have? Uh, we had almost 550, I believe. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Appreciate your support. Uh, Purple Heart Project starts the sometime in April. It's not that far away. We're looking forward to it. I eat so well that week. Meet wonderful people. It's fantastic. Thank you, Santa and Mrs. Claus. I tip my hat to you, as always. You taught me. You taught me everything I know about giving. Awesome. Good night to the vets. Good night to you, folks. Appreciate you being here. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. See you.